All right, start the recording. Let's get going. So, overall, people did. What's your name? Oh, you're sitting in the back today. So, averages were about where, where I like them. What's your name? Kaylee, sorry. No. It's okay. Estrada? Yes. So, um, we won't have to retake this quiz, which is good, because we've got another in-class quiz coming down the pipeline when we get to inorganic nomenclature. Um, and I like to do that one as a quiz because I don't like to have to ask it on the midterm. When we take the midterm or the test, you guys have enough to focus on. So I don't want you focused on nomenclature. But if you guys don't do well enough on the quiz version of the nomenclature, then, then I will put it on the midterm um, because I want to make sure you guys get that down so that you can go back and forth between formulas and names fluently, just like with the um, just like with the periodic table. The good news for that one, though, is I'm not going to take away your periodic table for that one. You're allowed to use the periodic table for that quiz and on the midterm. So, but it's not going to help you if you don't know what you're doing. Um, it might get you close, but you're still going to need to do some studying, some practice. So I think we'll probably get to, um, we might talk a little bit about um, inorganic nomenclature today. Um, nomenclature, if you haven't, have you guys heard that term before? Okay. Um, I've spent enough time in chemistry that I kind of forget what word is, you know, when a word is really common in chemistry, I kind of forget if it's not common in the real world. Um, so help. Thanks for uh, giving me some context. All right. So we're going to talk about how the electron configuration affects um, what are called periodic trends. It always, always, always comes back to the electrons and the protons. Um, but however, there, there's certain generalizations we can make about the periodic table and about certain properties of the elements um, that, that come back to the electron configuration, but they help us to sort of get an idea of what's going on and how things will behave. Um, All right, let's start by writing electron configuration um, for the elements at the top. Um, try and do it without checking your notes since we've already done several of those. Um, as you can see, I kind of have a few favorites that I always go back to um, when, I'm, when I'm asking these and it'll become clear why that is uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And remember, you can use the noble gas abbreviation if it's more than 18 electrons. So if it's past argon, you can use the noble gas um, abbreviations. Everybody remember what I mean by noble gas configuration? I'm sure, we've spent we've spent a, a little bit of time on this, and as I understand it, you guys spent some time on this in the past, so this should be pretty easy review. I'm just writing out the complete electron configuration as well as abbreviated abbreviated one, just to remind us how those first three rows go: one s two, two s two, two p six, three s two, three p six should be ingrained into your mind, right? There should be no possible way that you could ever miscount these ones, right? Anything tricky about sulfur? If we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 written up here, we already have sulfur written, right? 
Where is sulfur going to start or stop rather? Yeah, so sulfur is in the third row of the periodic table and it's in the P block. So in the 3P, it's got four electrons. So sulfur, 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P4. Piece of cake, right? Let's do, we'll do zinc and bromine and then we'll talk about valence electrons and then we'll talk about ions. Zinc is past argon again, so we can use our noble gas configuration. So we can say argon, or you can write it out the complete way. If you've got the hang of writing it out completely, the complete electron configuration, that is totally fine. You're not gonna get docked points for giving me a more complete answer. And last but not least, back to the opposite of least, I think, since bromine has the most electrons. Four S two, three D ten, four P five. All right, and just a reminder. Our three D orbitals, our first D orbital, the first row of the D block is in the fourth row, but it still belongs to n equals three according to our quantum numbers, right? So if we were just going by the periodic table, that wouldn't make any sense. But since we know how our quantum numbers and, and electron energy levels work roughly, we can remember that the first row of the D block is in n equals three. All right, the, any questions so far? Again, review at this point, we've done this. You guys have seen this before. You've known this since kindergarten. Um, the other thing I want to, a term that you've probably heard before, but I want to redefine is valence electrons. What is a valence electron? Anybody remember? Say it again, no? Electrons where, where um, an element can gain or lose them. That's actually where the term comes from. The word valence actually is a psychology term. Um, before it was a chemistry term that had to do with, with a person's potential, how much capacity for change they have. Um, now it's pretty much exclusively used in chemistry. Um, and it does have to do with how they react. Does anybody have another definition? Valence electrons are electrons that are in the highest occupied energy level. So not the highest energy level, the highest occupied ener energy level. Because Every single element, every single atom has every energy level available to it. They might just be way higher in energy than, than its electrons are. Um, so when we're talking about valence orbitals or the valence shell is the highest occupied energy level. All right, so for each of these, so for calcium, how many valence electrons does it have? Two. So the, part of the trick is it doesn't matter what the energy level is, whatever the highest energy level is, you're looking at how many electrons are in that highest energy level. I, if you want to, I guess um, a real world example, 
would be maybe in, in high school classes, there's, you know, Spanish one, Spanish two, Spanish three, Spanish four. The enrollment in Spanish four has nothing to do with its fourth class, right? That's like how many valence electrons you have. Might be kind of a stretched analogy, but the highest occupied energy level is four, but the number of valence electrons is two. Okay. How many valence electrons for sulfur? Nice energy level, not orbital. Six. The, the three S2, basically for, for sulfur, anything that starts with a three counts as valence electrons, right? So here for calcium, the the N equals three electrons don't matter because they're not the highest occupied energy level. Four is the highest occupied energy level. So anything that starts with four counts towards our valence electrons. Sulfur, our highest occupied energy level is three. So anything that starts with a three counts to our valence electrons. All right, so this might be a little bit different way than you've thought about valence electrons in the past. Because the easiest way to do it once you get used to the, how this works is you just look at the periodic table and you count how many columns it is from the left, right? Because that's basically saying the same thing. Aspen? That's exactly why I was gonna say, we wanna think about it like this and not think about it like, um, not think about just like count how many columns there are because the third energy level isn't the valence level, isn't the valence shell for zinc, right? So how many valence electrons are there for zinc? Just two, right? Because only the four S electrons count as the valence electrons. And then how about for bromine? Seven. So basically you can, if you're gonna use the, look at the periodic table and count from the left, you basically ignore the D block and the F block because those are never going to be in your highest occupied energy level with a few exceptions. All right, so for instance, we're going to talk about the octet rule in a few minutes, but um, just to set the table, so to speak, the highest, or every time you can fill an orbital, your system gets more stable. Basically, the most stable state that you can have for any atom is when you have only completely filled or completely empty orbitals. What that means is that there's some weird irregularities because for instance, copper, copper's electron configuration is not what we would expect using our normal rules. What would copper's electron configuration look like if we were following our normal rules? be the same as argon, and then 4s, we would expect it to be argon, and then 4s2, 3d9. But the d orbital is where things get weird. Just like the d orbital is where the periodic table, the rows stop matching up with with the energy level because the d orbital gets weird with its energy. Electron configuration does the same thing. If we have a choice, when we put that last electron in here, let's, let's pretend we're putting electrons in one at a time. When we go to put our last electron in here, 
we're only one electron away from being really stable by filling that d orbital. So I said that the other piece to um, everything is more stable when it's either completely empty or completely full orbitals. The other piece to that is the bigger the orbital, the bigger the stability bonus, if you want to call it that, when it gets filled. So if we have one electron left to put in here, we could put it in the 3D orbital and get 3D9 and have an almost filled D orbital and a completely filled S orbital. But they're so close in energy that what actually happens in the real world is that you get 4S1, 3D10. Because when we get the choice to either fill a D orbital or fill an S orbital, we're going to fill the d orbital first. The s orbitals and the d orbitals are so close in energy already that we basically get to decide where to put that last electron. So if you keep going to the left past copper, so so nickel. Let's look at just nickel since there's some some other weirdness that happens when you get to the middle of the d block. So let's look at nickel for starters. Nickel follows our normal rules. It's 4s2, 3d8. I believe there are some of them where you'll go d10 and, and have zero electrons in the s block. Um, I believe platinum does that. Um, but I believe nickel feels like this. So because it would take two electrons transferring over, that's takes more energy than we would get from our stability bonus. But when it's only one electron off and all three of the, um, the metals under, so copper, silver, and gold, they all do this. And which is one of the reasons why they're so stable as metals. Part of the reason that they're so stable um, is because they fill up a D orbital rather than having an S2 an S2 D9, All right? So there is some weirdness that happens in the D block when it comes to valence electrons, because how many valence electrons would we say copper has? Only one, right? So because the D, the D block and the S orbital, so the D orbitals and the S orbitals are so close together in energy, you get some weird interactions happening and some irregularities that happen in the D block. So in general, I'm not going to ask you about to list off the electron configuration for things that are in the middle of the D block. Does that, does that contribute to copper, silver, gold? It does. So they're stable, they're really stable having that D block um, filled, but they still have one extra electron. When you have an um, one extra valence electron, but the rest of it is also stable, that is part of what makes them so conductive. There's some other weird stuff that happens with conductivity too. Um, like for instance, aluminum used to get used in wiring. Um, aluminum is not very stable actually. We think of aluminum metal as being like, oh, it doesn't really oxidize or rust or anything like that. Um, but that's actually because it actually makes a layer of aluminum oxide on the surface that oxygen can't get through. Most metals, when they rust, they kind of get flaky and they kind of lose their structural integrity, right? And so that allows, when that happens, that allows more oxygen to get in underneath that layer of oxide and keep rusting. Aluminum doesn't do that. Aluminum oxide is actually, um, makes a crystal structure that's really, really stable. It's actually what sapphire is and uh, it's called corundum. Um, and, so what that what you get with aluminum is aluminum is not very conductive because it makes this layer of aluminum oxide and the aluminum oxide doesn't conduct electricity the way that most metals do. But we're going to talk about um, in our periodic trends, we're going to talk about metallicity or metal metallic character um, and we'll talk a little bit about what defines that and kind of where we would expect to find the most um, metallic elements. All right, 
What do we do when we have ions instead of? All right, let me finish my thought first about the, um, the D block when it comes to asking you guys questions about that. I'm not gonna ask you to list off an irregularity. If I'm asking you on a test specifically to write out an electron configuration, it's not going to be one of the irregulars. That said, there might be two points out of the 10 on electron configurations might be a question that says, Copper's electron configuration is this. Why does that happen? And have you explain kind of what we just said? Well, filling a D orbital is more stable than filling an S orbital, um, which accounts for that, the irregularity, something along those lines would be what I was looking for there. So I might tell you it's irregular and then ask you to explain why it's irregular, but I won't ask you to memorize the irregulars at this point. You take Gen Chem, that's not the, that's not the case necessarily. All right, what do we do if we have ions? If we wanna write down electron configurations of ions, any of our rules really change? Quantum numbers still behave the same way, right? Orbitals still behave the same way. We just have a different number of electrons than we're used to, right? So if we have an ion, you start by writing out your electron configuration for the neutral element. And then you just add or subtract electrons till you get to the right charge. So for calcium, calcium, well, I'm gonna write out the complete configuration just for the sake of seeing it. That's calcium when it's neutral, when it's, um, when it's in its atomic state. When it's charged, it has a plus two charge. Why would that be stable to have a plus two charge on calcium? So we have two valence electrons, right? Slowly? Exactly. So in addition to, if you, can, if you can have only completely filled or completely empty orbitals, that's good. If you can have only completely filled energy levels, that's even better. So if we have these 4s2 electrons sitting by themselves, the calcium is going to become more stable if it can ditch those two valence electrons. So the electron configuration for calcium ion is the same exact thing except missing two electrons. A little nitpicky detail here. Calcium, when it's an ion, only has 18 electrons, right? And that very carefully said, you're only allowed to use the noble gas configuration as a shorthand if it's more than 18 electrons. So for calcium, I don't, calcium ion, in once you get past this class, it's acceptable to just say, that that's not technically wrong but for this class if i'm asking you about an element that only has 18 or fewer electrons it's because i want you to write everything out okay what about if it's a negative charge same logic applies right if it's a negative charge we just have Instead of losing electrons, we have extra electrons, right? So sulfur normally, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. Sulfur as an ion, 3s2, 3p, Six, 
that gets us to having only filled orbitals and energy levels, right? What we'll see with these ions is the ions that actually exist in the real world are the ions that allow us to get to a stable electron configuration where we only have completely filled or um, completely empty orbitals. So calcium, when it was neutral, had two valence electrons. Calcium, when it's an ion, has how many valence electrons? Eight, because its highest occupied energy level changed. When you lose those two electrons, your highest occupied energy level is now n equals three, right? So now the number of valence electrons for calcium is eight. Gaining electrons doesn't really change how many, what our, our highest occupied energy level is. So that doesn't really change anything, right? We had, we we're in the N equals three and we're still in N equals three. So it's just count up everything that has a three in front of it. All right, last one before we move on. We'll skip bromine because bromine's not as interesting as zinc. Zinc, when it's neutral, looks like I'm going to write out the, the complete electron configuration again 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3p. 10. Zinc with a plus two charge. Most things aren't going to change, right? What's going to change? We have to lose two electrons, right? So how are we going to write that out? Or maybe the better question is, which two electrons are we going to lose? These are the valence electrons, right? So we're going to lose these electrons. Even though we filled up the d orbital after the 4s, once you fill a d orbital, you're almost never going to break it apart. It gets so much more stable when you fill a d orbital that if anything is going to break this apart, we're going to take the electrons from n equals four instead. So how many valence electrons does zinc ion have? Two plus six is eight plus another 10 is 18. So zinc with a plus two charge now has 18 valence electrons. The reason that it's worth going back to talking about how one, how valence, what the valence energy level is changes is because if you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the biologists under the bus here because they make a lot of generalizations about chemistry because it makes biology easier. Um, if you learned any, any of this in a biology class, they would just say things want eight electrons or sometimes 18 electrons. And they would just leave it at that and without going into why that would be the case. The 3D or the D orbitals getting filled is why it's everything wants eight valence electrons to be stable, but sometimes 18. The sometimes 18 is when the D orbital is involved. I, always, I remember learning the octet rule from and seeing it in a as a review in a biology class. And I just got that very general answer. It's not all biologists, um, just the ones that were teaching me biology. All right, any questions about electron configurations right now? We added some new wrinkles, right? Well, if there's no questions, then that was too easy. So we can add one more wrinkle. Okay.
So I remember I told you that there's things get weird when you get close to the end of the deal orbital, right? The other big stability bonus that you get from the F block and from the D block, especially, it shows up in the, in the P block as well, but it's um, the changes in energy are too severe to notice it that much. Um, so go back to when we talked about filling up drawing our arrows for these electron configurations. We Hun's rule was the rule that said that you always fill up empty orbitals before you start doubling them up, right? And you always filled them up with arrows pointing the same way, electrons with the same spin before you started doubling up. And I've kind of hand waved a bunch of stuff and said, that's where magnetism comes from when you have unpaired electrons, right? The reason that they all line up with the same spin is because that actually is, you get sort of a, a weaker stability bonus. It's not as stable as being able to completely fill an orbital, but it turns out if you exactly halfway fill an orbital, you get a half of a net stability bonus. So filling a d orbital is really good. When I say really good, I mean really stable. Getting an orbital exactly halfway filled is also a little bit more stable than having either four or six electrons in that d orbital. So you get some irregularities in the middle of the d block too, like chromium, for instance. Chromium, if we were writing out its electron configuration, normally we would expect chromium to be the same as argon and then. 4s2, 3d4, right? But we're one electron off from being able to have, instead of having a full s and four electrons in a d orbital, if we take one of the electrons from the s orbital and we move it over, we get two exactly halfway filled orbitals. So, Because life would be too simple otherwise. <laughs> no, um, it because because you get having a bunch of electrons. If you can't have electrons paired up, having them with the same spin is the next best thing, right? And so our options are: we could either have it like this, or we could have our 3D exactly halfway filled and our 4S exactly halfway filled. Remember, these are so close in energy that they're almost degenerate. They're almost to the point where Hun's rule applies, where you would fill all of them up half halfway before you start doubling up. But they're offset by just enough that it only acts weird like this when you can get to exactly halfway filled the orbital or to completely filled the orbital. And the other thing that we're kind of neglecting here is that these, we think of these as having fixed energies because that's the easier way to wrap your head around it. Turns out as we start filling these orbitals up, these energies actually change slightly. The d orbitals can shift up and down in energy a little bit and same with the 4s. And, and basically they can sort of mix together in whatever way allows it to make the most stable state. And so that's why we wind up with these weird exceptions like chromium's electron configuration actually being 4s1, 3d5. And same for molybdenum and tungsten, except with different n values. Right? And so it's the sort of thing I want you to be aware of. Again, I'm not going to ask you to recall that on the test. On the test, I'm going to stick to your regular electron configuration rules we've been practicing. But I might say, well, this is weird. Why does it do that? And ask you to explain something a lot about, about how that works. All right, and when I say explain, I don't mean like you're gonna have to do like a numerical derivation of a law or something like that, or calculate something to prove it to me. Just really generally, just like I just said, right? Yeah, you're not, we're not writing proofs in this class. <laughs> 
if you want to write proofs involving chemistry, then you want to go into physical chemistry um, and computational chemistry, probably. And um, good luck to you. <laughs> All right, questions on that last little wrinkle. And then I promise we'll leave these alone for a little bit. Have you ever written a proof? Um, I took, I was a math minor in undergrad. So I wrote lots of math proofs. I did not ever have to write a proof in chemistry. Um, in the sciences, we don't typically do proofs because disproving something is more what science is about. Science is about designing your experiments to give it a chance to fail and then throwing everything out the window if it fails, as opposed to saying, I can start from, from logic and define something. That's not really what science typically does. Um, not to say it doesn't happen, but you get some really weird papers that way where you're melding number theory and, and orbital dynamics and orbital symmetry. Um, and I could never wrap my head around that. And that was my field. Um, so it's kind of a very, very narrow group of people that would actually focus on that. All right. Counting valence. Yeah. Once you, Once you start putting the F block in. So if we were, if we were to look at, um, when the F block starts getting involved, it's it's like the D block except more extreme in every way. And so more, more irregularities and exceptions because there's more possible ways to arrange things that are close to the same energy. Um, and, and because now we have an S, for instance, if we looked at the six, at the sixth row of the periodic table, say, say we're looking at gold. Gold has the six S orbital the 4f orbital and the 5d orbital are all really close to the same energy. So there's a ton of different ways you can arrange them to try and get just the right number of electrons in just the right orbitals. No. So if I'm going to ask you anything involving the f block, it's going to be either it's going to be filled basically. I might ask you about something in the sixth row on in the p block where you have to go all the way through the F block and all the way through the D block, but I'm not gonna ask you about something in the middle. All right, so valence electrons, we're feeling pretty good about that, right? Our, our abbreviation, our, our shortcut of counting from left to right on the periodic table, count how many columns over it is, that's still a pretty good way to do it unless the D block gets involved, right? So basically you skip the D block when you're counting valence electrons because it's supposed to be in the third energy level, but we fill it up after the fourth energy level starts, okay? So neon, NE, how many electrons? 10, 10 total, how many valence electrons? Eight. So whatever is not a valence electron, we call it a core electron and core electrons don't matter, basically. Core electrons are never going to change. Um, and so we kind of ignore core electrons. So I actually didn't even mean to ask you how many electrons neon has, I meant how many valence electrons. I just didn't bother saying valence because the core electrons don't count. So why bother? For uh, electron configuration? I might ask you about to do, to do it. It's going to look, they're never going to have a charge though. But I, I might ask you to write out the electron configuration of argon. It's going to look like, just like this, right? Yeah. All right. So to go along with electron configuration and valence electrons, there's a couple other periodic, they call them periodic trends. Does everybody know what periodic means? Just every once in a while, periodically. Um, a periodical would be like a newspaper or a magazine or something. It's, something's published at a, every set amount of time. What about a periodic function in math? 
What's a periodic function used periodically? Um, that not quite. So a periodic function means it's a function that repeats. What functions from math repeat when you graph them? Sine and cosine. Sine and cosine are periodic functions and tangent. So why is it called the periodic table? Because it happens over and over again. Because every row is the same as the row above it, more or less. <laughs> Number of valence electrons doesn't change in the same column. All right, so the other periodic trends, trends that we can tie to the periodic table, um, the, the simplest one is we can predict atomic radius. Don't hurt yourself. Atomic radius changes, but it changes predictably, periodically. So when you go from top to bottom in the same column, if we looked at fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, which ones would we expect to be the biggest versus the smallest? Is it going to get bigger or smaller as you go from top to bottom? Why? More electrons, more energy levels filled, right? Remember that almost all of the space on these atoms is the energy, is the electron orbitals, right? So when you go from top to bottom, things get bigger. What about from left to right? in the same row, in the same row, why? From left to right. It's gonna get heavier. Is it gonna get bigger? What's, what makes up all the volume of these atoms? The electrons. And you're adding more electrons when you go from left to right, but you're adding them all into the same energy level, right? And I'll remember the shape of those orbitals, the shapes of those orbitals, as you're adding more electrons in, they're all kind of overlaid on top of each other, right? Remember when I drew the, the three different P suborbitals all on top of each other on the X, Y, and Z, and it looked really complicated and, and compact. Um, so as you add electrons into the same energy level, you're not necessarily going to get any bigger. So more or less, we would expect things just based on the electrons to, to stay about the same size when you go from left to right. But what else is changing when you go from left to right on the periodic table? We're adding electrons. What else are we adding? Protons, what do protons do to electrons? Change, change their energy levels, change the net charge. They attract them though, right? So when you go from left to right on the periodic table, you're putting more electrons into the same energy level, but you're also adding more attractive force pulling everything in towards the nucleus. So things get smaller, the atomic radius gets smaller when you go from left to right on the periodic table, right? So fluorine is smaller than carbon is, even though fluorine weighs more because it's got the same number of energy levels occupied, but it's got more protons pulling stuff in tighter. So you can think of it like, like they get more dense as you go from left to right. They get heavier, but they also get smaller. Until you get to neon. When you go from neon to sodium, what happens? We add another energy level, which means we go back to being less dense. Um, trying to, I'm pausing not to make you sweat or anything like that. I'm trying to decide if that's a good enough analogy to use it. Um, it's a little bit like how many square foot you guys, most of you probably still live at home, I would assume. Right. Um, when you go, when you leave home and go out and have roommates, um, 
if we keep adding more roommates into the same apartment or into the same house, what happens to your square footage per person? Yeah. Goes down, right? Until you reach the breaking point. If we try to put that ninth roommate into a four bedroom house, what's gonna happen? Things are gonna get thrown, feelings are gonna get hurt. So you're gonna get another house. You're gonna wind up needing to rent another house to try and fit a ninth person, right? That's effectively what happens when we're at, when we keep adding electrons. You get to a point where you can't fit any more electrons in one level. And so that lucky last electron gets more space all to itself by starting the next energy level. All right, so the other way you can think about it, it's kind of like, it's, this is a very dated reference, but anybody watch movies with typewriters in them? Yeah. Yeah. You type along, goes along the top, and then, and then all of a sudden you hit the return key and it stings back the other way, right? Radius, as you go from left to right, decreases until you hit some point where you filled up the energy level. And then it typewriters back up to the top. It jumps way back up to the top and then starts decreasing again. Right, so this is not truly a periodic function because it doesn't exactly repeat, but the general shape of it repeats. You get something that looks like it's approaching a certain value and then you fill that energy level and it ratchets up back up to the top. And then it comes back down until it approaches that energy level and then it ratchets back up to the top. All right, so in general, there's, it gets really hard to compare when you're changing two variables at once. But the way that I would ask a question about this would be, which of these two atoms has a larger radius? Um, if I am not careful about how I pick them, I can get one where you can't really, you don't really know, right? Because if it's further to the right, that would make it smaller. But if it's down a row, that would make it bigger. And there's a point where those cancel each other out. Right, and so I have to be very careful not to do that to you um, when I'm writing these these questions. But there's, you know, there's a point where lower energy level but further left means it's going to be bigger than higher energy level but further to the right. And again, I'm going to try not to ask you about irregulars on the test. I'm going to ask you to remember the general idea of. As you go from top to bottom, things get bigger. As you go from left to right, things get smaller. Makes sense, right? Once we once we remember that everything is really de determined by electrons. All right. So here's some examples. Which is bigger, neon or carbon? Carbon, same number of energy levels, carbon has fewer protons, so it's not pulling stuff in as tightly. Aluminum or gallium? Bigger. bigger, which one would be bigger? Gallium would be bigger, because it comes down to the energy levels. So I was a personality when I was a student and still to this day, I really hate being told to don't ask why, just memorize this. Um, so I would generally put in more work into finding a way to make it make sense rather than just memorize the trends. Because if you can relate it back to electron configurations and energy levels, then you don't need to memorize all the different trends because there's going to be like six of them. You don't want to memorize all of them. One gets bigger this way and smaller that way, and one gets smaller this way and bigger that way. You don't want to memorize all that. So instead, always come back to energy levels, electron configuration, and protons, because those will never let you down. About magnesium or bromine? That's This is one of those examples, right? I'm putting this in there to make the point that that one we would actually probably want to go look up a value because magnesium 
has fewer energy levels, but it's also way further to the left. So I would, I believe magnesium is actually bigger. Magnesium is at the very beginning over here and bromine is down here at the end of the other side. But again, I would want to go look that up to be sure. Right, Eddie? I won't ask you that on the test. Um, but like, but like, how do you, is there not a way to just figure that out without looking at that? No, not really. Not without doing all the math yourself. Um, no, it, I mean, the nice thing about this is that every person in the United States practically for the last 10 years has been walking around with what by 1970s standards is a supercomputer in your pocket. Um, with the ability to access the whole of human knowledge anytime you want. Um, so you don't need to memorize the exceptions. You don't want to have to look up every single one. You want to know the general ideas and know where they fall apart so that, you know, that's one I should probably look that up. Or helium versus neon, we don't need to look that one up. Neon's bigger because it's got the second energy level and they're in the same column of the periodic table. What about if we go the other way? Let's say strontium versus chlorine. I shouldn't need to say this after the quiz, but strontium is SR, right? Strontium should be way bigger, right? And this is not a case of bromine and magnesium where they're kind of acting against each other. Strontium is further to the left and it's further down. Both of those things are saying strontium should be bigger. What happens when it's an ion instead of an atom? If we come back to electron configurations and protons, our logic is still the same, right? So if we said, Oxygen with a negative two charge compared to neon. They have the same number of electrons. What's different about them? How come, why would we bother differentiating between these? If, because we have, we have a different number of protons, right? And protons do what? attract the electrons and make it smaller, right? So which one has more protons? So which one's bigger? Oxygen, right? So this is another reason to not just memorize the trends, but to come back to why they work that way is because then it becomes a lot more powerful because then I can say, well, what about calcium two plus versus chlorine, chlorine with a negative one? They have the same number of electrons. The only thing that's different is the number of protons now, right? And we can work backwards through the logic to say, oh, chlorine with a negative charge has fewer protons and the same number of electrons as calcium with a plus two. Therefore, chlorine would, with a negative charge would be bigger. All right. Questions on atomic radius, ionic radius? Here's another one we're going to bring back to. This is the other reason that, that it's worth spending time to talk about the weirdness of filling up orbitals in the D block. Um, ionization energy is more specific than it sounds. Ionization energy is not just, is not making any ion. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. Right, so it's not to give an electron to an atom. We're talking specifically about removing an electron from an atom. Energy required to remove an electron. So the summary slides are over there, but 
without looking at that, where would we expect it to be hard to remove an electron? What's going to be take the most energy to remove an electron? When they're getting pulled harder by more protons. So as we go from left to right, we would expect it to be harder to remove an electron. What else happens when we go, say, from fluorine to neon? We filled an energy level, right? Neon has a full energy level. A full energy level is harder to remove an electron from than one that's mostly filled. So when you go from left to right, ionization energy goes up. It gets harder to remove an electron. Go ahead. Okay. Good. What happened? What about when you go from top to bottom? Well, it says it decreases, but why? Because the fourth energy level, the electrons are physically further from the nucleus than the second energy level. Second energy level is physically closer to the nucleus, which means they're being physically pulled tighter. That's part of the reason why we get that, that atomic orbital energy levels and why we represent them as being low to high. The lowest energy orbitals are the ones that are closest to the nucleus because that's where the electrons are being pulled tight, most tightly by the protons. So as you add energy levels, it gets easier to remove an electron. To the point where at the bottom left, there's a few elements on the periodic table um, where if you look up ionization energy, it'll actually just say greater than, or it'll say uh, less than zero. It's, you actually can't force something like cesium or francium to keep its electron. It will spontaneously fling an electron off into nowhere. So those tend to be really, really reactive. Most, even things that, that get more stable by removing an electron, the electron still has to go somewhere. You have to have something that's going to accept an electron. You can't just throw electrons off into nowhere unless you get down to that bottom left corner of the periodic table. Uh, it's a good, a good uh, resource online. The, one of the better um, freely available and um, interactive periodic tables, ptable.com. Um, where it'll actually allow you to separate things based on, or to uh, recolor the periodic table based on various properties and trends like ionization energy. Ionization er energy gets is the biggest at the top right. And it's the smallest bottom left. And this is on the log logarithmic scale. If you put it on a linear scale, um, you know, neon and helium and fluorine are so much harder to take an electron away from than pretty much anything else that there's like everything is green other than that top right corner. You have to put it on a logarithmic scale to even be able to see it more as, uh, as a spectrum rather than just um, rather than just a single, a couple blues with a bunch of green. Some interesting things on here though. Look what happens at the edge of the orbital blocks. Look at, at zinc and cadmium and mercury compared to the elements right next to them. So there's some irregularities in these periodic trends too. If you look at zinc and cadmium and mercury, mercury is more blue than thallium is. It's more blue than a lot of them, these other metals here because mercury has only filled orbitals, right? If you were gonna take an electron away from mercury, you're breaking up a whole orbital to do it. Whether it's the S orbital or a B or, or a D orbital, we can predict that. But compare that to thallium, where thallium's got one, one electron sitting by itself in the 6P orbital, right? So thallium is, easier to remove an electron from than mercury, even though it's further to the right. 
And so ionization energy, just remembering the trends doesn't tell you the whole story. You kind of need to think about it in terms of orbitals. Um, and the, you can also see a little bit, it's harder to see in the D block, but looking at nitrogen versus oxygen, it's actually easier to remove an electron from oxygen than it is from nitrogen. Because what does nitrogen have that oxygen doesn't? What do its electrons look like? It's exactly halfway filled, right? So nitrogen looks like this. If we we're going to take an electron away from nitrogen, we'd be breaking up that half filled stability versus oxygen looks like this. If we took one electron away from oxygen, we could get to being halfway filled, which makes it more stable. So it's easier to remove an electron from oxygen than nitrogen, even though that's not what we would expect based on our normal trends. Right? So there's a reason that we do orbitals and electron configurations first before we start looking at the periodic table. Because all of the irregularities, they're only irregularities if you forget one of these variables, if you forget to consider something. All right. Um, the, there's one more that's not on this table uh, that I wanted to find that's very, very similar to ionization energy, except it's like we're going to take a double negative and apply it to ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy you have to, you have to put in to remove an electron. Electron affinity. What does affinity mean? What is, if you have an affinity for something, what does that mean? Yeah. It can mean that you're good at it. It can, but more than anything, it means that you, generally speaking, that you like it. So electron affinity is how much energy is released when you give something an electron. So ionization energy was how much energy do you have to put in to take an electron away? Electron affinity is how much energy is released when you give it an electron. You see how that's kind of like a double negative? I don't want to just say the electron affinity is the opposite of ionization energy, because but it's, it's opposite and also from the opposite frame of reference. So both for electron affinity and ionization energy, they kind of follow the same trends because where are we going to find the things that are most, that are going to have the highest electron affinity, things that are stabilized the most by gaining an electron towards the right-hand side, right? The closer you are to having, if you have one electron away from having full orbital, then you're going to have a really high electron affinity. So the halogens, column 17, um, copper, copper to some extent, because copper could ha get to having only a fill filled orbitals if, if we gave copper an extra electron. They have the same general trend, and which is why on on our on P table here, we can actually look at electron affinity and sort by electron affinity as well, and it kind of looks pretty similar. We have some weird irregularities happening right at the edge of the D block, right? Do the D block elements, they don't want to give up the ones zinc, cadmium, and mercury. They don't want to give up an electron. So they're high, they have a high ionization energy, but they also don't want to take an electron. So they have a very low electron affinity. Nitrogen and oxygen have some weirdness happening, just like before, right? Um, the other thing that's weird is that. The noble gases, column 18, they have a really high ionization energy and they're not stabilized at all by being given extra electrons, right? So they have a very low electron affinity. 
So the irregularities, again, are happening right when you get to full orbitals. What about manganese? Yes. Manganese, what's manganese's electron configuration look like? <laughs> Four S two, three D, five. Right. So by giving it an extra electron, we're breaking up that stability bonus that we get from being half full. Hafnium. Most of them are going to be so hafnium is weird because it's right next to having a full f orbital. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be it's going to be some interactions with that f orbital. Um, giving it an extra electron, giving half me an extra electron, winds up putting one electron by itself into the d orbital. But it had a full f orbital already. That one, those ones get more clear when you see if you have a wide form versus the condensed form, which I believe. Acnium is a little bit weird. It's off. Um, so it isn't just that it's exactly that you're starting a new a new orbital. There's some other weirdness going there, going on there as well. So we'd I would I would want to look that look into that specifically. The f blocks start getting weird, right? I sit, I started by saying the d orbitals where everything gets weird, and the f orbitals are where things get real weird because you also have radioactivity stuff going on. Um, I doubt that nuclear reactions are playing a role in that, but you can wind up with some of those really, really heavy, dense um, metals can wind up being so heavy that they can actually capture an electron and go through a nuclear change by turning a neutron or a, turning a proton into a neutron by capturing an electron. So there can be some weird stuff going on with that as well, um, where you might, you might be, by giving, me an extra electron, you might actually cause it to go through a nuclear reaction and not be hafnium anymore, um, which is weird, right? <laughs> electron capture is a is one of the ways that that nuclear reactions happen. All right. What is going on here? Wait. All right. And the last one, I told you we were gonna we we're gonna talk about this one. This is a weird one. Metallic character is not actually all that well defined. Um, it's there's a collection of properties that together we kind of consider them to be how metallic an element is. Um, but there, it's not one that I'm really gonna ask you any questions about. I just want you to have seen it and know what that term means. Um, because metallic character is really like things that are good metals, things that are metals have a couple of key physical properties. Can anybody think of what, what makes a metal a metal? Conductivity, electrical conductivity. To a lesser extent, it also is in, includes um, thermal conductivity. Anything else? It's gotta be more than that because graphene is conductive. And graphene is not a metal. It's shiny. Yeah, physical characteristics like literally, it's luster is the is the geology term for that. Um, so malleability. I, I heard somebody say it. Um, does anybody know what malleable means? Close. It comes from Latin word malus. Um, Malice, which actually in Halloween, Halloween theme, um, there was a uh, there was a very old book that was controlled by by the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, um, called Malice Malleus Maleficarum, which is translates to the witch's hammer. M Malice means hammer. It was what they used. That was the, the textbook for the Inquisitions, basically. Um, so, the, but Malice just means hammer. 
And so malleable literally means you can take it and when you hammer it, you can hammer it nice and flat. You can make a foil out of it literally just by hitting it with a hammer. So good metals are malleable. They're also ductile, which means if you grab them and pull, it kind of behaves like, um, like chewing gum. You can draw it into a wire simply by grabbing both ends and pulling. Um, so those are, those are all kind of weird things. And they, you know, to try and put a number to those, to try and say how metallic something is, would be pretty weird. Um, there are ways of measuring all of those, but they're all individual. Um, but in general, metallic character is tied to being able to have your electrons further from the nucleus and easier to remove. Things are more conductive, more malleable, and more ductile if it's easier to remove the electrons. So where would we expect to find the most metallic elements? Towards the bottom and towards the left. We don't think of things like um, potassium as being a better metal than iron, but it is. When it's in its metallic state, it's more ductile, more malleable, more conductive, and shinier than iron is. Thing is, it's also just really, really reactive under um, oxygen-rich conditions, which is, you know, most of our planet. Um, so we would never actually want to make, like, a circuit using potassium wires. Um, but in theory, if you were in a pure or in a, a system where you had no oxidizers around, you could make a circuit that would be very low resistance um, by using some of those really reactive metals. So again, one of the reasons why I'm not gonna ask you too much about it, but it's worth talking about. Material science is really fun. All right, one last thing. One last thing, guys, real quick. Um, the other part of this that's worth remembering is that knowing valence electrons and how orbitals work allows us to predict what the stable charges are likely to be on ions. We already did some of that, right? We already talked about that a little bit. If you have one valence electron, the easiest way to get to having only a full orbitals is to just lose one electron and be a plus one ion. So things in the first column of the periodic table, when they're more stable, what, or when they're an ion, they will always have a plus one charge. Things in the second column of the periodic table will always have what charge when they're, when they're charged? Second column, how many valence electrons? Two. So what's the positive charge going to be when it's mo most stable? Plus two, it's gonna lose those two electrons. Everything on the other side in the P block, that stair step line, the blue line that's taped over there, that's the line that divides metals from non metals. Metals, by definition, are whatever gain or lose electrons and gain charge. All right, we'll finish that up on Monday. I thought I had a few more minutes. Is it, is it 2 40? Oh, no, sorry. I thought it was Wednesday. I was off by an hour. <laughs> I'm like,